I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew, please. Matthew chapter 9. Our lesson will be taken from Matthew chapter 9 this evening. Matthew chapter 9. Please read along with me. Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea and came to his own city. And they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son. Your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes said to themselves, This fellow blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, then he said to the paralytic, Get up, pick up your bed, and go home. And he got up and he went home. But when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to men. In verse 8, Matthew says that the people, after having uh, heard Jesus forgive the paralytic and then heal him, Matthew says they, they praise God for giving authority, power, to heal and to forgive men. Now they heard and they saw what Jesus did and they glorified God for giving to a man such authority and such power. The people in this story gave honor to God but they didn't really get it. They didn't really understand. They didn't really perceive. How great their awe would have been if they would have recognized the full truth. And the full truth was that God himself was present before them. If they were awestruck by watching what they thought was a man do something, imagine how they would have felt if they understood that that man standing in front of them was the Son of God. Now, how many times do we miss a spiritual reality a feature of the unseen world that is right in front of our eyes, but because of lack of faith, insight, perhaps even purity, we miss it. For example, we experience suffering and pain, but we're blind to the discipline of the Lord behind it. We don't see the Lord working behind what we're going through. All we see is the pain. Or we feel the allure of temptation, but we don't recognize the form of Satan lurking in the background. Or we sense the inconvenience of a service asked of us, but we don't recognize the angel who's asking us for that favor. Or we see just people at worship, but we fail to see the presence of the Lord with his people. You know, with time, the Jews in this story became more blind to the realities of the unseen world, and ultimately they crucified the one that they had praised God for in this very scene. You see, the spiritual world comes into view as you practice looking for it. And if you don't practice looking for it, it disappears altogether as our eyesight, for lack of practice, becomes way too dull to see it at all. Now the rest of this chapter is filled with examples of people who saw or who missed seeing the unseen world. Let me demonstrate. Let's keep going. Verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. So Matthew as an example, saw the kingdom coming in Jesus and he left his world to enter into the kingdom with Christ. Matthew recognized Jesus as the Son of God and he left the God of Mammon in order to follow the Son of God. Let's keep going, verse 10 to 13. There's just one example after another. It says, Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, 
They said to his disciples, why is it your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So in this scene, the Pharisees, what do they see? Well, they only saw a man like themselves. And since they could not even see their own sins, they actually saw Jesus as a man who was inferior to themselves. And since they couldn't see their sins, they didn't recognize the one who had come to save them from their sins. They saw Jesus all right, but they didn't see the unseen part of the kingdom that Jesus was bringing with them. We continue right down, verse 14 says, then the disciples of John came to him asking, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and a worse tear occurs. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wineskins burst, and the wine pours out and the wineskins are ruined but they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. In this instance, it's the disciples of John. And what do the disciples of John see in Jesus? Well, they see competition, not completion. They saw someone that would take away from their leader's prestige, but they were blind to the fact that their leader was preparing them for Jesus. They were too blind even to see the purpose of their own leader, and so they missed the significance of Jesus' arrival. And then in verses 18 to 26, too long a passage, familiar one for us, let me summarize, but in the same vein as what we're talking about, in the passage in verse 18 to 26, we read about two people, the woman with the issue of blood and the synagogue leader whose child had died. These people came to Jesus for help with seemingly hopeless situations. One with a lifelong hemorrhage that no one could heal, and the other with a child that had died. However, they saw Jesus not just as a teacher, but as one who could heal, one who had the power from God over illness and death. And their vision of him was confirmed as he healed the woman and restored the child to life. We keep going, verse 27 this time, verse 27. It says, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, it shall be done to you according to your faith. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him throughout all the land. And so in this scene, the, the blind men, you know, they couldn't physically see, but they nevertheless could see that Jesus was the Messiah. They called out to him, Son of David, Lord, which goes to show you that you don't need physical eyes in order to see the unseen. And then in verses 32 to 34, it says, as they were going out, a mute, demon-possessed man was brought to him. After the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. And they were saying, nothing like this has ever happened, uh, excuse me, has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. After yet another great miracle is performed, before their very eyes, the Pharisees again refused to see what is by now plainly evident that Jesus is the Messiah. They have become so blind that they see only what their evil hearts want to see, and that is that Jesus somehow represents or is the devil. And then we finish up the, uh, the, uh, the chapter, verse 35. It says, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom 
and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. So the apostles only saw people, when they looked at the people that followed Jesus, they only saw people who were poor and leaderless and sorrowful. But Jesus tells them to see the people as a harvest of souls, ready to be gathered. And so in each of these situations, people were faced with two worlds, the world that they saw and the unseen world. And their ability to discern the unseen world required three things, and I would like to share those with you. And if you're wondering, say, you know, that passage of scripture sure sounds familiar. That's because Marty was preaching off of this this morning. <laughs> but he went in a completely different direction, which shows you how wonderful God's word is. Amen? Amen. We can preach on it, and he could, he could come back here tomorrow and preach on it again and take it yet in another direction to edify, to edify everyone. The reason I read all of these is that they're just a collection of stories or incidences that, that demonstrate how people were observing, whether they actually saw what was before them or if they actually saw the thing that Jesus was trying to show them. And in order to see the unseen, a couple of things you need to have. Number one, you need to look for it. You want to see the unseen world, it's there, but you have to look for it. In Hebrews 11:6, the writer says, and without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11:6. For those who think that this world is all that exists, for those who think that this world is all that they see, Everything said, everything done, and thought about relates only to what can be experienced physically. Some people, that's it. That's the sum total. But in order to see what is unseen, the Hebrew writer tells us that the individual must believe that it actually exists and search for it diligently. The world around us that we can see points to a world and a God that is unseen. Paul tells us this in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. He says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Notice what he says here. Everything that is seen, points to someone who is not seen, not seen. The conscience that he mentions a little later on or before this, the conscience within us also relates to the physical universe, but we know intuitively that the conscience was designed to function in a universe that is unseen, and that is the moral universe. I go back to chapter one, of Romans, this time a little further back in verse 19, he says, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. So our outer world and our inner world both make a witness that there is another world, an unseen world that exists, and in order to see it, we must want to see it and look for it diligently through prayer and the reading of the word and devotion to God's service. You know, Cornelius in the book of Acts prayed and he did good works and God let him see an angel that gave him the instructions on how to bring the gospel into his, into his home. Another thing we need to do in order to see the unseen. And these are not just like suggestions. This is what we actually have to do in order to do this thing. So another thing to do in order to see the unseen is believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Why do you think that's the confession of faith we make when we become Christians? Because faith that Jesus is 
truly the Son of God, that we accept that as true, that we believe that, that's the key that opens the door to the unseen, unseen world. Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father, John 14, 9. And God sent His Son Jesus as a human for the express purpose of allowing human beings to actually see God. We can't relate to God in His pure form, pure spirit form. There's no way we can relate to Him. And so God condescends to us to become a man that we may have a glimpse of God in Jesus Christ. John says of his experience with Jesus, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld and our hands handled. 1 John 1 verse 1. And so the key to unlock the door that opens to the unseen world is the belief that Jesus is the divine Lord, the Messiah, the Son of God. I go back to John. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And the Father is in the unseen world. And Jesus is saying, you cannot go to the unseen world. You cannot see the unseen world unless you come through me. I'm the one that takes you there. I'm the one that opens your eyes to these things. And so the people in Matthew who just didn't get it, they shared one common feature. They did not believe that Jesus was more than just a man. They did not believe that He was the Son of God. And because they did not have that faith, they couldn't see the things that He was showing them from the unseen world. Those that did became witnesses not only to God's power, but also to His purpose for their lives. You know, people long to know God. People want to gain insight to spiritual worlds that they know exist. And they try all kinds of methods and practices to gain access. But the only way to have one's eyes opened is to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. That's the only way to the Father. The only way that the eyes actually open so that you can see the unseen world. And then finally to be able to see the unseen you have to leave this world and live in the unseen world. It's a little difficult. If you want to see that world, you have to leave this world, go to that world. Now the reason people don't see the unseen is that they like it here in this world a lot. They love sin. They don't want to let it go. What did Jesus say? Uh, uh, Marty was quoting that. The, the very familiar passage in John chapter 3, you know, verse 16, for God so loved the world, you know, and it was appropriate in his lesson. But if we go a couple of verses past John 3.16 and we get to John 3.19, that's where Jesus explains why people stayed in the dark, why people could not see who he was, why people did not get a glimpse of the unseen world. And why is that? Jesus says it. And this is the judgment, that the light is come into the world and men love the darkness more than the light, for their deeds were evil. People don't want to see the unseen world. They want to stay in this world because they like this world. Now some people knew that it exists. They even knew how to see it, but they refused to do so because they want to stay in this world and continue to enjoy for a little while longer the things that are familiar to the eyes, the things that are familiar to the taste and to the touch and to the senses. They don't want to let that go. Anyone who begins to see the unseen world faces a dramatic challenge. He or she must now deal with what they have seen. It's like Peter. They bring him in before the Sanhedrin, they beat him up, they threaten him, they do all kinds of things to him to tell him, stop talking about this, stop preaching this gospel, stop talking about Jesus. And what does he say? You know, I paraphrase, I can't deny what I've just seen. You can beat me up, you can threaten me, you can kill me, but I, I can't say that what I saw isn't true, I've seen it. 
Well, that spirit, that understanding has to come down to us as well when we're challenged in the world. Maybe we're not threatened to be beaten up. Satan has other tactics for us. He burdens us with a lot of material things. He seduces us into too much activity. He makes sure that we, we dig into this earth here and we sink deep, deep roots so that you know, we, don't, we don't budge. Why? Because if we see that world, if we get a glimpse of it, we'll want to leave this world. We'll be in a hurry to leave this place. As I say, anyone who begins to see the unseen world faces a dramatic challenge. They have to deal with what they've seen. The Pharisees, they chose to deny the reality of it and block the view so no one else could see it. And the doubters refused to change their vision to accommodate the new reality of what they had seen. You know, don't bother me with facts. My mind's already made up. And the sinners ignored the call to take a look, preferring to enjoy what was before them instead. But some people whose eyes were opened, some of them left everything, abandoned the status quo in order to follow the new vision of the unseen world revealed to them by Jesus Christ. You know, unless we leave this world and enter the unseen world, our vision will only serve to harden our hearts and dull our eyes to spiritual things in the future. You see, seeing without changing results in blindness, spiritual blindness. Now, it is possible and necessary to perceive the unseen world. We don't propose any magic tricks, no voodoo, no voodoo, no emotionalism, get all hot and sweaty, jump up and down, yell out Jesus' name 40 times in a row. That's, that's not what we're talking about. It's possible to perceive the unseen world. It requires that we accept the reality of this world and begin looking for it diligently. Have you ever had the prayer, Lord, let me see more of you? Have we ever prayed that prayer? Lord, open my eyes to my own sinfulness. Have we ever prayed that prayer? Lord, give me a greater glimpse of heaven. Lord, expand the capacity of my heart to understand what your will is for my life, for my service, for my ministry. That's the kind of prayer that seeks the unseen world. I've also said that it requires faith in Jesus Christ as the one who will reveal the true spiritual world to us and bring us there. Those of you who are regular Bible readers, you know, that's a misnomer. I've always called it regular Bible. I'm a regular Bible reader, but I'm, I read my Bible every day. You see, I started out as a regular Bible reader two, three times a week, and then I said, why not four times? Well, shoot, it's Friday. Why not five times? Pretty soon it got to be a habit. If you want to see the unseen world, you have to put your eyes on Jesus. Look at him. He's the one that shows it to us. And the only way to do that is to read his, word, his words. Read about him. And then it requires that we be prepared to leave this world and enter the other world because once you see it, you must go there. One of the big problems in mission work, for example, is uh, there was a time where the, the strategy of the church was to bring missionaries or you know, uh, people from other countries to bring them here to the United States and train them here and then send them back to their countries. And many who came uh, were from developing countries, very poor countries and so on and so forth. And uh, we were finding out, those who were training the missionaries, that these individuals were coming from these poor countries eager to learn more about the gospel and be trained, but once they had lived here for three or four years in the United States, didn't want to go back. They wanted to stay. Why? Well, they saw a vision of a country that was orderly and prosperous and not violent and, and so on and so forth, you know, so different from their own nation. It was 
a tremendous temptation to not want to go back. Why? Because they had seen something that was so much better than their, their own place. It's the same way when we see the kingdom. We want to be there. We don't want to be here anymore. Isn't that what Paul talks about? He longs to be with the Father, but he says to the church, but it's better for you that I stay. He had a good vision of the unseen, unseen world. So I ask you this evening, how is your spiritual eyesight? Every sermon has a point. Every point has something that we need to hopefully ask ourselves. How's your spiritual eyesight? Now, if there was a scale, you know, like on your sermon notes, there's a scale there that ranged from I'm blind to 2020. How would your spiritual eyesight register? Where are you there? You know, I had a friend in Montreal many, many years ago who was blind. He was blind almost from birth. Um, and he could not operate, or they couldn't operate on him. There was nothing to do. There was no way. There was no technology to help him uh, receive his sight. He was permanently blind. Nothing that human technology or modern medicine could do for him. Thankfully, there is a treatment and a healing for spiritual blindness. We don't have to stay that way if we don't want to. It begins with a desire to see, a confession of belief that Jesus as the Son of God can cure us, and a decision to come out of the darkness and walk into the light, because the light that the Bible gives is the light that shines on the unseen world. And so if you're uh, blind, if your spiritual eyesight has gotten blurry lately, why not come to Jesus Christ who can cure you and restore you with perfect vision, with hope and with forgiveness. Those who wish to see tonight or to see again, we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement. Brother Harold. <clears throat> 